I'm Brad Hartley, and welcome to Critical Mass TV. This is the show that embodies thinking outside the box, but also asks, why is there a conventional thought box in the first place? And most importantly, who owns this uh, creativity container, and how do they benefit? It's Sunday, December 8th, and we're broadcasting live from the VCAM studio in beautiful downtown Burlington, Vermont. Speaking about emerging from a literal box and making a difference for millions of people's daily lives, I would like to say farewell to Nelson Mandela of Soweto, South Africa. Mr. Mandela was another shining example that the true giants of liberation throughout human history are all anti-authoritarian, that occasionally among us there are women and men courageous enough to speak truth to power with the force that even armed ruling class authority can't stop. Please remember that the South African apartheid, or literally separation system, was a symptom of the greater economic apartheid that lays over us all. As long as there are haves and have-nots in a world of limitless potential, the challenge of the young to change the big picture will always remain. So tonight, we are honored to have five local young people as special guests on Critical Mass TV. Critical Mass being the fewest people necessary to sustain change in the world who better to involve in discussion than the young? People who still have the amazing ability to create positive change. Now, these brave students, and I say brave uh, because who isn't at least a little camera shy, I mean all of us are, have recently finished a public speaking project focused on social issues. They have read their speeches for their teacher, Chris Wyckoff, and in front of the class, and have now agreed to present them live for you tonight. These five speeches were chosen by the class and members of the class. A special thanks from me to the students, teacher Chris Wyckoff, and our mutual friend Lee Shorey, for being a motivated liaison and to helping and helping to make this even possible. So uh, I think we are just going to get right into the speeches. So um, it's uh, let's see here. I'd like to first of all, I'm going to introduce Anna Willenbaker. But uh, firstly, it's very nice to have all you here with me. I really appreciate it. And I think. Um, what we'll do again is have Anna lead off with her speech about animal negligence and then when she's done we'll all talk about the issues uh, involved for a few minutes and then we'll move on to the next speaker does that sound okay to everybody does that make sense okay um, so uh, here we go here is Anna Willenbaker and her speech is about animal <coughs> negligence to a cell, where the only attention that you ever receive is when your door is open to be fed your food or water, 
or a life where your sole purpose is to pop out eggs and live in a two-by-two -two metal cage until you become useless. America develops relationships with many of its animals, but a large portion of them are forgotten. Animal cruelty is present everywhere in American culture, and most of the cases seep through the cracks. Animals have been mistreated especially through experimentation, animal fighting, and factory farming, all of which are occurring in the United States at this time. Although many people provide loving and caring homes for their animals, most animals in America are in neglectful hands as I speak. The humane societies respond to local neglect cases and often take control of the animals. In a well-known mistreatment case in Highgate, Vermont, a man was shut down in 2011 for nine reportedly found calves standing in their feces, hens and roosters living in poorly ventilated coops, and a dead horse lying behind a pile of debris, its throat slit. This man also had a horse still living that consisted of only a rack of ribs. It is sickening that people keep animals when they don't have the proper means or time to care for them. Those who are undeserving of animals simply shouldn't have them. Cases such as this happen on a daily basis. Animals are being neglected, and we need to make an effort to save them before it's too late. In November of 2009, I began to notice a group of horses being collected at a local farm. One night, we decided to stop at the farm and investigate what was occurring. I shined the flashlight into the barn door, and the beam of light landed on the backs of many horses. They were beyond neglected. They were walking racks of bones. A round bale sat out of their reach, unopened. They're not being fed, and their water trough was dry. I wondered, what leads people to treat animal and animals in such a way? We returned the next day and discussed the situation with the owner and found that he was sending them to slaughter. He had collected them from local internet advertisements in order to make a buck from selling them for meat, for human consumption in Canada. We immediately jumped on this and decided that we needed to rescue them. We rescued them with a fellow organization, Spring Hill Horse Rescue. We took six horses and Spring Hill took the remaining 14. I have researched horse slaughter since this life-changing event occurred. Horseful, horses don't die a peaceful death from this monstrosity. It isn't a quick death either. They're forced into a chute while a captive bolt gun is thrust through their cranium. This is only to paralyze them. They are then hoisted into the air to be skinned. And in most cases, are still conscious. This is an extreme version of animal cruelty. I still wonder what leads people to do this, ignorance or apathy? I understand that some people don't have enough money to care for their animals, and that is not always their fault. However, it becomes their fault if they don't find a home for them before they become maltreated. I also understand that in some cultures, horse meat is normal and may be considered a delicacy. Although I think that is bizarre, my problem with horse slaughter is that it is inhumane. Horses aren't treated correctly on the way to slaughter or during the process. It is an amoral act that needs to be stopped. Many people come up with reasons for animal cruelty, but in the end, it isn't something that just happens. Humans cause the problem. Animals can suffer just like we can. The entire world has issues with animal cruelty. This issue won't end until people can identify when or when not they can properly care for an animal and follow through accordingly. Until then, the animal rights advocates like me will need to continue to keep a lookout for maltreated animals and get them to safety. This is a responsibility that I've taken under myself because too few people are willing to take charge. Please help me fight this problem. We must stand up for what is right. Be thankful for what animals offer us and include them in our golden rule. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. That, um, I, I, your delivery of that speech is absolutely awesome. I mean, you, you seem like you've been doing it forever. And um, I can tell by like the strength of your conviction, you know, that you really, really, you get the issues and you understand, you know, what's, what's, um, you know, what's involved. Yes. It's, it's tough, <clears throat> like you mentioned briefly, that it's tough to be in a society of meat eating people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us, you know, really enjoy it. And to counterbalance that with the rights of, of sentient beings, you know what, what I mean when I say sentient beings? Mm -hmm. It would be a non-human animal that we don't give the same kind of, you know, standards that to, uh, as we do to other people. So, um, 
it just um, it, it's just a tough it's a tough thing to balance, but to, because animals do need to be slaughtered. Do you do you think I mean you know to feed the the marketplace? Yes. So it's the commercial <laughs> pressure of us wanting to raise animals for meat products that, that builds in a lot of conflict, and then there's the then there's the 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 experimentation on animals issue, and then there's also people neglecting pets, which exactly. is a, all, those are all different issues. Um, do you, do you guys, all of you, do you think that animals have rights themselves? I do. You yeah. think they do? Especially if you're raising them for meat. Right. You've got to give them some respect if we're raising them just to eat them. So the quality of the life they would have before they were brought to slaughter, you think that would make difference better than, more than just the flavor of the meat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think so, too. I think they should be treated humanely yeah. through that process. We, I mean, people... Not only are other animals predatory, and they, they also eat each other and meat, but um, it, I just think it's important to, res, you know, to have respect for those creatures, and they're not industrial machines. I, I, I agree. Um, yeah, then there's a question, like you, you would have to, like a, someone who is intentionally neglecting, or not, or, or is just in a situation where on their little farm, say they're, they have four, three or four neglected yes. horses. Um, there's, a, a, is there a difference you think between intentional harm and neglect due to mental Ill, incompetence that comes from like mental illness? You know, so the owner can be, I guess what I'm getting to is, is if, if the person, if they're discovered to have animals that are being mistreated, do you think they should ever be able to get those animals back or should they be allowed to have more pets in the future? You know, it's just hard to, hard to figure out. I think people that may be incompetent, I mean, they may not know how to care for the animals and I, there's nothing really we can do about that. But I mean, they should, they should have the right to have them, but they should be monitored if they do have a mental illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> uh, mental illness is coming, you know, it's always an issue and it's always a very important issue how we treat mental illness, um, especially with all the, the recent rash, rash of shootings and whatnot. And I think everybody attributes a lot of these shooters to, to, to suffering from mental yes. illness. And, and I, it, you know, we don't do a great job in this country about dealing with just the everyday mental illness conditions amongst ourselves. So, um, yeah, does anybody else have any other points they'd like to make about that? Okay, so Justin Soder is going to be our next speaker, and he is going to talk to us about the loss of the small family farm. Take it away, Justin. Thank you. So, again, I'm going to be talking about small family farms, and I guess to start off, basically, if you don't already know, small family farms are in crisis, and they may become non-existent if something doesn't change, and many are going out every day. Large farms, we got a couple in Ferrisburg where I live, like the Bryson's farm is running quite well. You know, they can pay for their employees, they can pay for their equipment, maintenance, cows, all that, and just and do just fine. But small family farms are going out of business because the cost of maintaining the farm keeps rising and the milk prices stay the same. And for small farms, generally milk prices, all the milk they put out is their only source of income. An article I found on the Timestribune.com states, an eight-ton delivery of sand that costed him about $180, $180 three years ago now costs him $260. His electric bill has doubled, doubled over the last five years to about $1,000 a month. Diesel prices have risen to 32% in just the last year. And one farmer that... Um, one farmer that sold off his last herd kept his heifers that weren't milking yet and hoping to restart his herd. And he said, there's no future in it right now. And he doesn't know what to do with his heifers because of that. Basically, uh, the other day I got asked, why are family farms important? 
Part of it could be because of the family tradition, the life quality. I know I would like to love to have that life quality, and I don't right now. But the farm that I work at, I would consider a small family farm, even though I'm an employee. There's only three of us that actually work there. My boss, his girlfriend, and me. And, you know, I love it. You know, it's a tight, like, family relationship, pretty much. I even consider it my second home. And basically, there's always something different to do. It's not always the same thing day after day. And the farm that I work at, you know, money's tight. It's, you know, bills keep coming in and money's not. He sold his herd in 2000 because of his debt. And he just wanted, I guess, a break or something because he was just so in debt that it was overwhelming him. And he just restarted his herd, I think, in 2010, or basically four years ago. And we just added 30 cows this summer, hoping to double the amount of cows we have, along with double the milk production. And we're, and because of the, because when we got them it was in the middle of the summer, when we had the dr drought and the high heat, it basically all the stress on the cows caused them to drop in milk, and it basically made the cows almost useless unless we put them for beef. And a quote that I found in this circumstance is the light, the light in the tunnel is almost too dim to see. And I think that's true. And there, he may not have to start considering other options of why, other options of things to do for the farm. But then again, like many large farms can continue and they make a profit, you know, with all the stuff that they keep doing, they keep buying equipment, they keep, they can have employees to take care of all of their work. And basically the boss can sit there, put his feet up, and still be making money. And no, it's not a bad thing. I mean, that's basically where most of the milk production comes from in this country. But back before it started industrializing and becoming huge, small family farms were the way that slaughterhouses got their meat. It wasn't all these big farms. But if prices don't go up and change soon, many dreams, including my own, will be crushed. So please spread the word or talk to the state representative or something just and let them know that small family farms either need aid, which there's a lot of it, but it's hard to get, or the milk prices need to go up. And if you want to know why it's important, you know, you can come ask me or go ask a farmer that owns a small family farm or someone that works for them. And look them in their eye as they tell you why. And then maybe you'll understand. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Justin. That's, um, I can tell that's really heartfelt. And I think all of us have kind of grown up around farming communities. And, you know, we really, we get that. <clears throat> um, I, I see one, you know, there's probably going to be a common theme. And it's one that I touch on in the show a lot is, is the commercial pressure. So the scale of the farms that you've talked about that are staying competitive, it's like any industry that you can think of, including the media industry, um, it's called consolidation. And it's all part of the way the most powerful people in this country have designed the system to benefit the larger the institution, the more profitable they are, and then the more they because of the nature of corporations and business and capitalism, their intent is to crush in th their competition. Um, you know, that's systemic, it's built in. And people can talk a lot in leadership levels about the small family farm and, and family values and quality, but they don't do anything. As a matter of fact, well, they don't do anything to help small scale farms. They do a lot to help these gigantic large institutions, okay? They subsidize them. So um, the one, one thing that you can, the most, what, what could happen that would be the most effective, but it's incredibly difficult when you're already working really hard. It's like my little small store business. 
um, if it was possible for me to organize with a hundred other little Vermont general stores. You see, just in the act of organizing together, we could buy together, we could control costs, we could act like a much larger institution, but we wouldn't. We would still be all independent. Uh, so one, one answer that, that you could, that's possible to work with is organizing small family farms and believe me, I know how difficult that would be, but you can begin to operate and have clout and influence like a larger company if you had an organization of small farms. And you, like anything important that, that people do, um, you, you really can't sit around <clears throat> and expect your, your elected governments to really do anything for you. I can, I could go into it for, for 10 minutes, but simply put, there hasn't been any positive change in working people's lives in the last 150 years that they didn't do for themselves. From, from getting children that were chained in factories in Vermont in the 1800s, they literally had children chained in factories and mills working 16, 18 hours a day and they couldn't even go to the bathroom. But people in the streets demanding change got that to go away or, or got them to stop doing that. Um, and it goes on and on from civil rights to protecting the environment. The government never did any of that for us. It's, it's us getting in the streets and demanding change. Um, and it's, believe me, these are really tough issues. And, um, but it's interesting that in Vermont in the 1800s, about 90% of us lived on small family farms. I think it's even more than 90%. And also in the 1890s, up until 1900, um, Vermonters provided over 90% of our own food for ourselves. So, and now that just the opposite is true, most people, over 90%, don't live on small family farms. And, um, and we actually import over 90% of the food that we eat. We're bringing it in here. So some of the other answers can be um, the diversification, which you've probably heard of. Like if you go to one of these family or you look at the family farms that are at the local farmers market, and some of them are actually incredibly busy, but they've gotten out of a conventional commodity like milk production, and they've diversified into growing, whether it's turkeys or, or lamb or, you know, or pork or vegetables, you know, they've diversified. And then, of course, you, know, you can stay in with the milk production. So, you know, those are some answers, but, um, generally the, the bigger players that are dominating that milk market now, um, the processors uh, actually make most of the revenue. The farmers are getting a little piece of it, even the big farms. The retailers who sell the milk at the store are getting a cut, but the actual large, large profits are going to the companies like Dean Foods, or who, or there's a lot of, uh, that are processing the milk products, and they're, because they can now, they're basically keeping most of the money which is really hard to combat. Um, but you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. A cooperative like Cabot has always been really successful, even though now they're growing and growing and growing, but that's always been a collection of New England dairy farmers and Vermont dairy farmers that actually own the company. And they're working as a cooperative to then market the value added product, which would be the cheese. Yep. You know, you're adding value to the milk. Um, does that make sense at all? Yeah. Some of those big commercial um, issues are, they're not super complicated, but they definitely are tough to tackle. Yeah. And um, like many issues, organizing amongst each other are the answers, you know, is where the solutions lie, but it's, it's really difficult. What do you guys think? Any? Well, on that website that I listed, it was the yeah. timestribute.com about this farming thing. That's where I got my quotes from, but it also touched on the farmers are selling milk for between anywhere between twelve to twenty dollars per hundred weight of mm -hmm. milk, and you go into a grocery store and you're getting a gallon of milk for four twenty nine. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> and you know, it touched on like where is the milk going, or all the money, I should say. Yeah. You know, where mm -hmm. what's the gap and where is it? You can break it down. It's the processor themselves that have the vast majority of the profit margin in that gallon of milk. And they have a lot of, their, by their scale, they have a lot of clout with politicians 
um, the larger the company is, the more they contribute to the two established political parties we have in this country, which buys you influence. And they try to shape agricultural policy by spending money to lobby those representatives and regulators. And you look at any industry in this country, and the bigger the, bigger the companies are, the more powerful they are, the more influence they have in the governmental system. Yeah. So money really drives it. So you, you have, you, it's very difficult to, to approach that issue in that way. You're never gonna outspend them and you're never gonna out lobby them. So you have to somehow figure out how to make a change at a grassroots level, which is gonna build like a sustainable solution. But you know, you're turning grassroots into milk there. Um, and the, uh, the only other in the country, the largest growth in any, in, in, across all different agricultural sectors is organics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, think of what you will and, and you know, there's a lot of issues involved in, in organics, but the, in the only sector of the agricultural economy that's growing is, is organic food production and retail. So that's another thing to think about. People are really buying it, you know. If you have a choice, do you want 150 industrial chemicals in your food. I mean, if yeah. you can avoid that, um, even the big processors are going organic and buying up organic companies. So, okay, Justin, that was really awesome, and thank you. Uh, next, we have Michaela Vanderway, and she is going to deliver her speech about abortion. to talk about abortion. The definition of abortion is the termination of a pregnancy after accompanied by resulting in or closely followed by the death of the embryo or fetus. Did you notice how the word death is mentioned in that definition? For my social issue, I will be talking about how I feel that abortion is wrong. Although many people believe that the fetus is not a living thing, I believe it is and that abortion is immoral. The article called Pros and Cons of Abortion, written by Brittany Roth, supports how I feel about abortion. Roth says, I believe being pro-life will give unborn children a chance to grow and mature and to fill, fulfill their dreams to their fullest. They deserve to live and have a heartbeat and to feel the emotions of love and being wanted Taking away an innocent, helpless miracle is the worst thing one could possibly do. Many women who decide to have an abortion end up regretting it. Hannah Rose Allen says in her article, I deeply regret my abortion and will be a voice for my baby now, says, I am here today to tell you that many women, including me, regret our choice and wish with our entire beings we could undo it. My belief is that women who, cho who choose abortion are often deceived by the message of choice and are not truly aware of the destructive consequences. They hear the voices insisting it's not just a clump, it's just a clump of cells, not a baby. If abortion were not legal, I never would have chosen to have one and I know many post-abortive women who share this viewpoint. Some pro-choice advocates say that abortion is acceptable because they do not think that, abortion, that the fetus is a human with a human life. I think that that is wrong. If we can't know that the human life begins before birth, how can we know if it begins at birth or later? Pro-life advocates believe it begins at, the, at conception. Therefore, abortion is immoral and a crime even though it is legal. This quote from Hannah Rose Allen really stood out to me. After all, it is legal, so it must be right and good. I realize that this is an ad popular fall fallacy. Everyone is doing it, so it must be okay to do. Abortion may be legal in all 50 states, but it is wrong and should be made illegal. A fetus is a living, breathing thing, and abortion is the same as ending a human life. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela. I know that's a that's a very difficult <clears throat> subject to tackle, and you did a fantastic job. Thank um, you. Yeah, there's 
over the last you know 20 or 30 years there, there's almost been um, a, a social issue in, in this country that's um, there there hasn't been anything that's been almost as divisive as the abortion issue you know where uh, Roe versus Wade I think is it was a 1973 court decision and uh, and we've gotten to this point and there's still very strong opinions but not just on both sides there's a lot of people in the middle that um, you know that that see both sides and you know just really where where do you go with it so um, I just wanted to point out um, that before Roe versus Wade um, there's there always is uh, in a free society there always was and always will be a, like a demand for um, women that don't share your strong conviction they, that want to um, have the right to have abortions um, as part of their personal life and and um, so when when that was happening and it was um, not legal then you have a lot you, you create a black market and you'll tend to you know have doctors that may not even be doctors or may not be certified <clears throat> and there was literally hundreds and hundreds of cases every year of women being severely injured if not dying from so I don't I, I don't think I've ever met a person that was like pro-abortion that was really excited about it you know it's it's kind of tragic for in, in every way I think and, and I think we all get that but uh, you know, and I'm not just asking you a specific question. I'm sort of rhetorically just asking a question for all of us. Um, you know, is there any way to have a middle ground? Can, can, um, you know, can can people make a choice and and have that as a private discussion with their own doctors and, or or can you as a person just willingly not participate in abortion, and be satisfied with that? And I think, I mean, society says no, we can't. We're we're still deeply divided. Um, I just wanted to, um, I, I personally think the world would be in a tremendously better place um, if women had a lot more uh, political leadership positions. So if the world wasn't entirely dominated and run by basically rich white dudes, <laughs> um, I, I think we would be in a much better space. I think women have a lot to contribute. Um, I think we would probably be, be saner and less violent and more accepting as a society if women were in leadership roles. <clears throat> so um, say, say, and you are a woman, if, if the very first time or the very first, you know, several times you have sex, if you're, if you're pregnant, impregnated by the man, um, see, see how that sort of but due to the responsibilities that come along with that, how you're, you, you're sort of removed um, in some way um, from being able to participate in, in, in the, the politics of, of life. I mean, it's certainly not impossible. You can definitely be a mom, um, but you do lose a little bit. Uh, you can be a mom and still be a leader. Obviously, you can. Um, but uh, being, being, having the right to control your own pregnancy and their timing and whatnot. Um, I, I can just see, you know, that there is a lot of validity in a medical sense. Um, just women feel empowered when they can make those decisions for themselves. So I know I'm not really asking you a question. I'm just sort of going on, but but I, I'm just sort of playing the devil's advocate and, and, and bringing up the other side. Um, I think the only people in history that were ever pro-abortion were called eugenicists. And before World War II, m mostly made famous by Hitler and the, and the German Nazi party. But it was also extremely popular in the United States where um, forced sterilization and abortion <clears throat> were actually being uh, institutionally perpetrated on people that might have a mental illness or, or that... Um, or, for, or, or be based on their race, um, believe it or not, that was happening in this country. Um, so I think we've we've moved beyond eugenics. I think we can we can all see that that all people have their basic rights. And um, I I just you know it's it's an intractable issue. Do you guys have you know what do you think? 
Is there is a solution to that possible? Well, right now, actually, um, like you said, we're not exactly on middle grounds for both sides, you know, both ideas of what is and isn't right. But um, right now, I'm really happy with the way things are going for women, where if they do want an abortion, they can do it in a healthy way, not mm -hmm. in an unhealthy way that could cause a lot of harm to themselves. So as much as we say we're not on middle grounds, in a way, I feel like we are. Because it's going to happen one way or another. If someone exactly. really wants an abortion, it's going to happen. Yeah. It really is. And then there's contraception, also preventing pregnancy just by taking the pill or the morning after pill or condom use. I mean, yeah. you know, so intelligent use of contraception. Uh, you know, some people who are extremely, um, I you know, fundamentalist in their beliefs about, the, about um, that that's fundamentally wrong to even prevent a pregnancy. But there definitely is, is um, you know, some obvious practicality in contraception. What I think is that, yes, I think it should be made illegal in some cases. Like, if you are choosing to have sex and you don't go about the right way, like taking the pill or having a condom on, if you just go out and you're like, oh, I'm pregnant, I think I'm going to go have an abortion now because it doesn't fit, you should deal with that consequence of not thinking ahead before. But if a rape vi victim decided she wanted an abortion because she didn't want to deal with that, I think that's understandable. If I got raped, I wouldn't really want to have a kid. Mm -hmm. But if you're just not going to accept the consequences of not thinking ahead, I don't think it's right. All right, I get that. You're you're talking about like a person's personal responsibility yes. and mm -hmm. um, there's actually a quote from Obama that about abortion or Barack Obama, the president, about abortion, about he doesn't want I can't really remember the quote exactly, but he doesn't want his kids to suffer the consequences if they were to get pregnant. And that's coming from our president. You know, and that's so we're all those consequences, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's how we all got here. But then you come to the problem of monitoring, like I completely agree with you, Michaela, as far as the, um, you know, if you're going to go out and openly have sex and just continue to get abortions, you know, that's not right. But the problem is, how do we monitor that? Yeah. Or the 99.9% .9 chance of if it's going to work, and like how do we monitor that is another big question. But I feel like people like other people can't really monitor it it has to be from you like your personal decision if you just aren't going to think about oh i can just go openly have sex and i'll be fine and i'll just get an abortion i mean that's not right like you should think about i might get pregnant i probably should have a condom or take the pill or something like that yeah. You shouldn't just keep getting abortions after and after. Well, yeah. if it's true that you get like super depressed after you get an abortion, mm -hmm. or I don't remember what the side effects were, but I, I know one was like massive depression. Yes. Like, mm -hmm. And you wouldn't you would think that would teach you enough. Yeah. Like, exactly. If you keep, that, right? Yeah. You don't want to go back to yeah. being that depressed. I mean, it's mm -hmm. kind of like yeah, I guess I shouldn't go there, but. <laughs> so, so can you imagine, you know, if, if people had more conversations like this while you were growing up, while you're going to school, um, education can really help to solve a lot of problems. And you can almost, in a, like a democratic process, you, you, you cannot make all of the people happy all of the time. Yeah. So at some point we need to find middle ground on these issues and figure the most intelligent, fair, humane, and, and uh, way to, to to solve it, and everybody's not going to be happy all the time, but we're definitely capable of solving all issues. Like mm -hmm. in school, they talk about like in sex ed, they talk about pregnancy and how to prevent it, but they don't talk about abortion and the side effects. I think that if people got taught that, then they would think maybe I should think more about using a condom or things like that. They would sway against having an abortion to prevent the side effects. So make sure that the sex ed that you're getting is, is balanced and shows all sides, you know, regardless.
not only that, but um, having parents talk about this with you yes. is a huge deal because, personal story, I remember sneaking out of school a few times to no. go to Planned Parenthood with one of my friends just so she could get birth control because her <laughs> parents weren't okay with it. And, like, the, going to that extreme is a little too far. I wish birth control was more <laughs> open for you to get. Yeah. Yeah. Because no, it's, it's a smart way, you know, to deal with something like that. Right. I mean, that, that's a huge chunk of the solution. Yeah. So open access, for, even for young people, to yeah. birth control. Yeah. Is probably a very good idea. Without that being involves parents. <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> tough when your parents are not, you know, helping you out in that in that way, or you have a difference of opinion with your parent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very good discussion, guys. Let's um, let's move on. We've got Matteo Palmer, and he's going to talk to us about the rising cost of college. Have at it, Matteo. Uh, good evening. Like my fabulous host said, I'm going to be discussing my opinion on the price of college. Now you're probably all thinking my opinion is that it's too high. And you'd be correct. Uh, the price of college has skyrocketed in the past several years. When looking at the history of most colleges, prices have actually doubled every 10 to 12 years. Although some people may argue that colleges need to set a high price for education, I do not think that it is fair for students to be left stranded after college with an astronomical debt. Colleges need to revisit their financial structure and find alternate ways in making money other than charging unreasonable amounts of money for education. One of the reasons colleges are charging so much money for education nowadays is because salaries of administration and faculty have gone up. A quote by John Curtis from the article titled, Why Are College Costs Going Up? states, Presidents are being paid in line with corporate CEO salaries. Presidents, meaning the executives of colleges, are being paid much more than they were years ago. The quote relates the change of salary of a college president to the salary of a corporate CEO. This then leads to the colleges having to charge students more for their education as the college faculty needs to be paid as well. Students are charged more because college presidents want higher salaries? I see this as unacceptable. There must be some other way for colleges to gain money without leaving students and families in debt. I think colleges should keep faculty salaries reasonable. Doing this would help students and their families in their financial obstacles. I am currently a student searching for the right college. Every college I've looked into is very expensive, and I'm still wondering how I'm going to be able to pay for it. My parents only just finished paying off their student loans, and they went to college 25 years ago. And the price of college has increased since then. Imagine how long it will take for me to pay off a student loan now. Not to mention, it's also so hard to get a job in the United States right now, I don't even know if I'll be able to, pay, to make the money I need to pay off a student loan. My connection towards this subject really supports that changes need to be made. I am aware that colleges need to make money but I also believe that they must find an alternate way of making money other than putting students in debt. Keeping reasonable wages for college faculty would help a lot. This would make it so students would have less trouble paying for the colleges of their choice. Thank you. Thanks, Matteo. Boy, that, that really does ring home. I remember <laughs> paying many, many years for my, to pay off my student loans. You know, um, after, I'm, after I've heard you, the first thing that occurs to me is, in a country that spends nearly a trillion dollars a year, which is a thousand billion dollars on war machines, <clears throat> and basically uh, you know, dominating the earth and all its resources militarily, 
why is our universities even running with a business model when you've got that kind of money that you can spend <clears throat> on weaponry and, and you know and basically securing resources for big companies um, so first of all that just to assume that it has to be a profit driven business model doesn't necessarily have to be true there's a lot of countries that sees beyond that and and um, and obviously you look at what's happening with prices in every store everything's mm -hmm. going up yeah. so when you treat it like a commodity it's good the price is going to rise it doesn't have to be that way right so I mean you know obviously it is though and we have to deal with it the way it is on the ground but um, from Middlebury College to UVM to, which are basically small schools to the to the big large universities around the country you realize that they have multi-billion dollar what are called endowments it's the cash that they control that they mostly have invested in Wall Street and all, with stocks and and then mm -hmm. they also just like a huge investment company they they have ton, literally billions and billions of dollars invested even Middlebury I think has two mil two billion dollars so why do they have all that money and what are they doing with it? You know, it's another question to ask what, what's it, what is up with that? Yeah, um, right. You know, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, so you, you did a good job looking into why costs are increasing and whatnot as far as executive salaries. And um, I, I just wanted to, 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 again, being a little bit of the devil's advocate. Um, so say you, um, you own a big company or you are running a big university what at what point do you give your your students or your or your customers too much information where they actually get over educated and then they turn and come after you so say I'm a big multi-billion dollar college I mean and I'm completely just speaking off the cuff here but how much education do you want to give your students to where they realize what the game is and they turn it back on you and start to try to, to get a just yeah. more fair shake. So there's a little bit of that built into the system. Um, you really, there's a famous quote from a guy that worked for the Agency of International Development about, about giving foreign, or giving um, aid, which we call foreign aid to their country um, to help them in education. This was a Caribbean island um, plan in the 1980s. And the, he said, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said, um, you know, why do we want to give these people an education? Because then they're just going to want a job. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a, there's a built-in conflict of interest when you run a school as a business. Um, um, so, and, and just around the country, if you notice too, another trend is like the arts and humanities and social sciences are being stripped out and, and the, their budgets slashed, and that's nationwide, while business schools are being built all around the country with huge multi-million dollar budgets even being donated by big fortune 500 corporations and really aggressive sports competition are starting to be a huge chunk of what these colleges do they're yeah, they're literally yeah, running their athletic departments like a business mm -hmm. and they're generating hundreds of millions of dollars yeah and i don't see why they can't do more of that really just instead of instead of uh, getting money more from their students and putting them in debt. Think they should pay those students that they're making hundreds of millions right. of yeah. dollars off of maybe? I, I think there's just a lot more options that they could use instead of just putting families in debt. Not even just students, but even the families that mm -hmm. of those students. So yeah, right, you could do a lot, lot of short-term things first. Like uh, alumni donations or just fundraising too. And mm -hmm. a lot of the big universities have these big sports, a lot of big sports, and the broadcasting rights of that could just get money from that, That's too. That's where it's, the money comes yeah. from, is the TV contracts mm -hmm. for broadcasting. So the better your football team is, the more money yeah, you right, can exactly. demand, and, and the more you make. It's still, you know, it's still a risky way to try to, mm -hmm. to yeah. run an education system. I know it definitely generates revenue. But right now, given giving them that money and letting them decide where it goes, they're not reinvesting it in a higher quality education mm -hmm. or give you know, so if you let the fox guard the hen house, a lot of times the hens don't really do that well. Right. <laughs> but um, 
you know, I, I, I just wanted you to think just for a minute that, well, why isn't it a public, uh, why don't we have a public option? Even if you have a lot of big profit-driven universities, why isn't there a public option mm -hmm. where, where people of modest means like some of us or most of us are, why, where we can go get a quality education mm -hmm. and not be in debt for hundreds of thousands of dollars for years? That's, it's, it's morally wrong. Right. That's yeah. my personal opinion, too. I, I agree. Um, and um, you, all you guys are hopefully going to college, but you have to figure out creative financing solutions and, and work the way it sits now, you know. It kind of working your way through is another way to avoid some of that crushing debt, but it's tough. Um, right now, I'm actually looking at quite a, I mean, I've applied to a couple colleges, um, but community college has been talked about a lot in my family um, for the first year just to get the core credits out of the way because mm -hmm. I could get that same education at a big university if I really wanted to. It would just make more sense to pay less for it. Right. Why pay the high dollar for your intro Exactly. Classes? And then, yeah. you know, transfer to say I graduated from this university. But that's most yeah. of the talk that's going around in my family right now. Oh, it's happened in my family. Our, our uh, Kathy and my son Samuel uh, went to CCV for two years and got his associate's degree, and I think his total student loan debt is eleven thousand dollars or something. Wow. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you went to Champlain, that would be thirty-five a year yeah. Yeah. for those first two years. So yeah. it's crazy. Okay, so we are going to move on now. We have Sierra Pominville, and uh, why is drug use so high? Is the topic. Actually, that is not the topic. It is rehab, not jail, for struggling addicts. I'm sorry, Sierra, but take it away. <coughs> Hello. I am here today to focus on the penalty of driving under the influence. Although some people may think that the harsh punishment of jail time is the perfect way of disciplining an individual of this crime. I do not agree with the idea of jail. I believe that there are other, more successful ways of teaching someone that drunk driving is a 100% terrible idea. I've been researching the punishment that each state has when there is an individual who is found drunk driving. I came up on the website dui.finelaw.com that informed me of what the individual who is guilty of this crime has to serve. They said, generally speaking, First-time DUI offenders can expect to incur a fine and face the possibility of jail time. Repeat DUI offenders will incur harsher fines and will almost certainly be sentenced to a number of days in jail. Now, how is jail going to cure the urge of drinking and driving? I believe that if someone facing these charges was instead forced to go spend two to three weeks at a rehabilitation center, the likelihood of them drinking and driving or even drinking in general would decrease. Personally, I have dealt with having an alcoholic of a father my entire life. I've watched this man come home and throw down drink after drink and then proceed to go out to the store. He's had too many DUIs and the scariest part was that when he went to jail, he lost his license and that led to losing his trucking business, all due to alcohol. My dad went to a rehab center for a month or two as I remember. And when he came back, I never saw him lay a finger on any alcoholic beverage. My father did quite well for himself when he was sober. So from my experience of having a father who drank morning to night and then getting clean because of rehab, leads me to believe that rehab would help many, many other people. I do understand that sending someone to a rehabilitation center would be expensive, or it may not even work. However, through my experience, jail never worked. Rehab cured my father from alcoholism for a few years, and I think it would be better for anyone with an alcohol addiction to get treatment, followed by meetings at least once a week to keep them clean. Thank you. Very good job, Sierra. See, I told you it was going to be easy. <laughs> you did a, a perfect job. Um, personally, I mean, from personal experience, I am a recovering alcoholic and a drug addict. So um, I have some firsthand experience with, with those issues. Um, 
It's been a long time. I think 28 years for me as far as being clean. But um, That's amazing. It, well, thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it definitely worked well. Yeah. <laughs> a lot happier in my own skin when I was am not high. Good. So, um, yeah, it always, I, I always wonder why spending thirty to $50,000 a year on a prison sentence for someone um, that is convicted of a minor drug crime is acceptable, but um, spending zero dollars on rehabilitating that person is, uh, or even even if it was a, a you know a thousand dollars, people are all up in arms about the cost of rehabilitation and whatnot. Seems a little short sighted. Like, what is the cost to society when that person goes back out, or the reoffends, or or acts yeah. out, and you know, what's more expensive? Um, it's definitely clear that jail time is not a solution to drug addiction. No. Um, but I can sympathize with that situation, and uh, you know, I hope he's I hope he's getting help and staying clean. Uh, I was wondering too, how uh, you know how successful is rehabilitation nationwide and and worldwide and whatnot? I'm sure there's lots of um, you know countries that are or, or states that are working with rehabilitation. Do, do you know? Actually, right now um, in Mr. Wyckoff's class, I'm doing a debate. And in one of the res I was researching this actually earlier today, and I found that in San Francisco in San Francisco in 2009, the 11 percent of people were treated correctly. That means the other how many weren't. And it kind of it's 89%. hard it, it's hard to believe that 89 percent of people didn't get treated correctly because I mean most of the articles showed that when they aren't treated correctly, they're the reoffenders. They're the people who end right back up in jail and we're paying for them again to go to jail. I don't know. It just it doesn't make sense why anybody wouldn't be for rehab. Yeah, I know. I, I understand that. Prison costs a lot of money. <laughs> and I mean, I was talking from the perspective of a taxpayer. Right. A lot of money. Yeah. It is thirty or fifty thousand dollars a year per person. Yep. So it's incredibly expensive. And um, another question that we need to address just as a society and as a group is, is why is there such a desperate need to, to, to dive into drugs as a young person? Like what are we, it's about escaping from reality, but what are we escaping from at such levels? I'm, um, you know, the drug issue is, is vast and there's from South America to, you know, to around the world where the drug supply comes from to when it's end use, the end user is here in the United States, it's multi hundreds of billions of dollar a year industry. You know, it's just outrageous, incredible. So that we need to do a lot of work on that the whole drug issue. And obviously the end use costs us a lot and destroys families, but can you imagine in the whole drug supply chain, the people that are suffering? To, to be honest with you, my, this is gonna sound strange, but in a way, I understand why my dad drank like he did. I completely get it. Just like hearing some of the things that he's ever been through. Was it escaping? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so usually there's an ugly reality, at least partially there, that a person is trying to escape from. And that's where I believe the meetings would come in handy, you know, the weekly meetings where he can sit there and tell people what he has been through to help them understand why he drank. Okay. And to help him. Exactly, to be there for him. So we have about one minute left, and um, I'm just going to finish up here with a, a little statement, if I can find my stuff. There it is. Um, there are several things that I want you guys to take away from this experience, and I mean being on the show here with me. The first is that overcoming one's anxiety and putting yourself out there is a very powerful thing. You guys are masterful at that. I would have never known that you hadn't done this 50 times. Um, <laughs> Very few people have had much impact either being silent or letting others do their thinking for them. A person doesn't have to tackle like giant grandiose world issues to be an activist. Courageous, fearless people are also required for our communities to be safe, productive, and compassionate. So being socially active is about the best thing you can do for your community. 
Secondly, a quote from the great 20th century anthropologist Margaret Mead says it all. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. <clears throat> so organize, it's the most productive you can ever be. So thanks again, everyone, for participating. You can contact me at, let me get my little sign up there, criticalmassbrad at gmail.com if you either want to make a comment or ask to be on the show, if you're brave enough, um, please contact me. It's about mixed mental arts for intellectual self-defense. Next time, Art Break will return, and Arthur and I will be tackling genetically modified organisms, biotech, and Monsanto's influence on policy. Good night. Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, I'm talking about rock stars. Uh, Did that sound like they had done that?